Bonsoir, Olivier Michelon, conservateur de la Fondation Louis Vuitton. My name is Louis Michelon. I'm a curator at the Fondation Louis Vuitton. Thank you for being here, for listening to Jane Gallier. I'm going to thank her twice. First, for her lecture tonight, and also for the help she has given us in organizing the Egan Schiele exhibition. She's contributed her invaluable expertise, and this is reflected in an essay that she wrote that you will find in the catalog. We needed Jane, and we needed the Jane's work to appreciate and understand, as well as stage, the work of Egan Schiele. As you probably know, Jane also authored the catalogue raisonné of Egan Schiele. She's also an expert in Egan Schiele's work in that particular period in time in Vienna, the turn of the century. She organized a number of exhibitions and wrote a number of books on the subject. So her expertise in the subject is uh, the continuation of uh, her family tradition since 1979. She's been uh, jointly managing the Saint Etienne Gallery, which was founded in 1939 by Otto Kallir in New York. The previous gallery was created in 1923, and it opened with the very first posthumous uh, uh, exhibition for Egon Schiele. Today, the Saint-Étienne Gallery is a veritable institution for early 20th century Viennese art, including Egon Schiele and Oscar Kokoschka. So many thanks to Jane for bridging the gap. Before handing over to her, I would like to say a few words about upcoming events as part of the Jean-Michel Basquiat slash Egon Schiele exhibition. We'll have a, uh, a concert and, and screening very soon. We'll have a Thelma uh, Golden Conference as well. On December 15th, we'll have a performance by Pierre du Crozet, who's a writer. On January 21st, we'll have a, a concert, a tribute to Jean-Michel Basquiat. Many thanks for giving Jane Collier a very warm welcome. Enjoy the lecture. Thank you, Olivier, and thank you, audience, for coming here this afternoon, braving the traffic and the weather, and our American president, I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> um, I, I'd also uh, like to commend the Fondation Louis Vuitton and uh, its staff and the curator, Dieter Buchart, for assembling such a groundbreaking Sheila exhibition. The pairing of Sheila with Jean-Michel Basquiat naturally invites comparisons between the two artists, uh, each of whom was exploring personal and social identity at a moment when conventional mores were in flux. And in each case, the quest was driven by the artist's extreme youth. Both Sheila and Basquiat died at the age of 28. Uh, precocity, then, was another factor uniting the two. This pair of exhibitions at the Fondation Louis Vuitton feels especially timely given our current sense of upheaval and the pervasive fear that we're living on the brink of radical change. Sheila's work appears so contemporary to us, it's hard to believe that he died 100 years ago. But in order to properly understand Egon Schiele, we have to understand, first of all, that he was the product of a very different time and place. In the late 19th century, Austria, like much of the Western world, had enjoyed an economic expansion driven by the Industrial Revolution. But the resulting prosperity wasn't shared equally by everyone. Many of the people who flocked to Vienna from all corners of what was then a vast multinational territory lived in squalor. Economic inequality and ethnic tensions would soon tear the empire apart. 
Nevertheless, when Sheila was growing up, everything seemed calm on the surface. That illusory calm was maintained by a social rigidity, which many young people, and not just Sheila, found unbearable. The writer Stefan Zweig later described the atmosphere as follows. Austria was an old state ruled by an aged emperor, a state without ambition, which hoped to preserve itself unharmed solely by opposing all radical change. Young people were therefore considered a doubtful element, which was to be held down or kept inactive for as long as possible. Egon Schiele was born in 1890 into a family of bourgeois civil servants. His grandfather, father, and uncle all worked for the Austrian Railroad, which at the time was emblematic of the empire's command of modern technology. Egon and his sisters, Melanie and Gerti, lived with their parents above the railroad station in Tuln, a town on the Danube about 30 kilometers west of Vienna. Egon's childhood obsession with drawing trains logically inspired his parents to imagine that he'd grow up to be a railroad engineer. But Egon was a terrible student, and after his father died in 1904, the 14-year-old boy lost all interest in academics. When, in 1906, Egon's teachers suggested he leave school, it was assumed he'd get a job to support his sisters and widowed mother. But Sheila had other ideas. Against the wishes of his uncle, Leopold Chiacek, who was now the boy's guardian, Sheila took and passed the rigorous entrance exam for the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. At 16, he was the youngest student admitted to his class. The curriculum at the Academy of Fine Arts had hardly changed in over a hundred years. Students began by copying antique plaster casts and then progressed to drawing from live models. They were taught to aim for slavish, three-dimensional verisimilitude. Sheila soon grew bored and frustrated with his conservator professor, Christian Griepenkerl. And Griepenkerl, by all accounts, hated Sheila. The devil shat you into my class, he once said. Griepenkerl's dictates notwithstanding, the stodgy historical styles advocated by the academy had been under attack for some time. In 1897, the Austrian avant-garde, uniting behind the motto, to the age its art, to art its freedom, had founded the Vienna Secession. In his poster for the Secession's first exhibition, Gustav Klimt used the Greek myth of Theseus slaying the Minotaur to allegorize the youthful revolt against Philistinism. Despite their rebellious stance, Klimt and his cohort were surprisingly successful in attracting supportive patrons. To supplement the promotional activities of the secession, the so-called Klimt Gruppe in 1903 established a design collective, the Wiener Werkstätte, which catered to the newly rich industrialist class. And in 1908, the Klimt Gruppe staged a groundbreaking survey of cutting-edge contemporary art, which they called, quite simply, the Kunstschau, or Art Show. The 1908 Kunstschau provided Schiele with his first extensive exposure to Klimt's work. The impact was strong and immediate. The young artist spent much of the next year imitating and absorbing the master's style. In addition to adopting Klimt's use of decorative ornament and metallic paint, Sheila copied his subjects. The two artists' interpretations of the mythological Greek character Danai, however, are interesting as much for their differences as for the similarities. Where Klimt transformed the myth into a parable about the inexorability of sexual desire, Sheila's Danai, as flat as her ornamental setting, isn't especially sexy. Form during this initial phase of the young artist's development took precedence over content. 
Sheila was interested in the intrinsic power of line and in the relationship between positive and negative shapes. Long after he'd abandoned the decorative approach of 1908-09, these two fundamental aspects of Klimt's legacy would continue to distinguish his work. In addition to in-depth exposure to Klimt's paintings, the Kunstschau showed Schiele that there was a creative world outside the dull halls of academia. Moreover, it was evident that the inhabitants of that world actually enjoyed considerable professional success. It's no wonder that Sheila leapt at the chance when Klimt invited him to participate in a second 1909 Kunstschau, even though it was technically against academy rules for students to exhibit publicly. At this point, Sheila had just about had it with the academy anyway. Uniting with a group of like-minded classmates, he issued a written protest against the Academy's conservative teachings that in many respects echoed the secession's earlier declarations on behalf of expressive freedom. Then, faced with expulsion as punishment for challenging the established order, Sheila and his comrades resigned from the Academy. At the age of 19, Sheila had embarked on a professional career. By 1910, the artist had rejected Klimt's decorative approach and emerged with his own distinctive expressionist style. However, traces of the master's influence still remain in Sheila's elegant use of line and his awareness of negative space. Paintings such as this portrait also show the influence of Oskar Kokoschka, whose embrace of expressionism predated Sheila's by about a year. In turn-of-the-century Vienna, where private patronage sustained most artists' careers, portraiture was a primary source of income for painters like Gustav Klimt. The problem for younger expressionists like Sheila and Kokoschka was that their portraits weren't in the least bit flattering. They therefore had trouble attracting paying customers. Sheila's greatest ambition was to create monumental allegorical statements about the human condition, similar to the public murals that established Klimt's reputation at the turn of the 20th century. But even Klimt had trouble selling his allegories to private collectors. And Sheila had to confess that his own allegories were often so obscure that they had meaning only for himself. Thus, Sheila's attempt to follow in Klimt's footsteps by painting portraits and allegories didn't prove very lucrative. By mid-1910, his family had cut him off financially. And though Sheila had managed to cobble together a small group of sympathetic patrons, they balked at the artist's demands for unconditional support. Sheila would remain constantly on the brink of economic disaster until shortly before the end of his life. It's clear from his writings that Sheila considered oil painting his primary artistic outlet. However, today we're inclined to give equal or even greater weight to his works on paper. In part, this is a matter of practicality. The oils are far less numerous than the works on paper, and most of them are in Austria. But even during Sheila's lifetime, collectors tended to gravitate to his watercolors and drawings. And I think this is a, to a gr degree understandable, because while Sheila painted some extraordinary canvases, he was, in many people's opinion, simply one of the greatest draftsmen that ever lived. Sheila never went anywhere without a pencil and sketchbook, and he drew almost every day. As a result, the artist's works on paper record his emotional fluctuations on an ongoing basis. The drawings that Sheila did between 1910 and his marriage in 1915 should be viewed much as one would a teenager's diary. That is, as an extremely personal and inherently private exploration of self. Sheila used his self-portraits to try on different identities, as adolescents do, to see which ones fit. 
There are many alter agons in the resulting drawings and watercolors, some ugly, some beautiful, or angry, confrontational, or pensive. Sheila was play-acting, attempting to create external visual correlatives for eternal emotional states. We see comparable emotional extremes in Sheila's male nudes and nude self-portraits, whereas some images suggest amputation, castration, suffocation, or guilt, Others document the artist's early sexual conquests with proud bravado. Sheila's female nudes and semi-nudes are likewise ambivalent, uniquely capturing that combination of fascination and fear so typical of an adolescent's first encounters with the opposite sex. In acknowledging his fear, Sheila simultaneously acknowledged the power of female sexuality. Sheila's women are real human beings, not passive objects of erotic delectation. It is this recognition of their autonomy that sets Sheila apart from other male artists. The traditional academic nude was designed to subdue and diffuse the power of female sexuality. Single point perspective pinioned the woman in a space where she was beholden to the male gaze. Her subordinate position was reinforced by a frequently supine pose. Her genitalia were often concealed, and her preternatural beauty turned her into an artistic object, remote from the messy world of human sexual fumbling. Sheila unwittingly violated every one of these conventional tenets through erratic cropping, distortion, and unnatural color. Because he habitually dropped out all background detail in his drawings, his women appeared unmoored. Rather than receding into a safe distance, they pop out at the viewer, threatening to breach the boundaries of the picture plane. The radicalism of Sheila's approach is especially evident in his depiction of reclining models. It was the artist's practice to have his models lie down on a mattress on the floor and to draw them from above, perched on a ladder or a stool. The vertical orientation that he gave such sheets through the placement of his signature reflects his elevated perspective. But in combination with the elimination of background detail, this verticality creates a sense of spatial dislocation that many viewers, particularly males, find very unsettling. Over the years, Sheila's recumbent nudes have often been titled, reproduced, or hung in ways that endeavor to impose conformance with the conventional paradigm. For example, it should be obvious that the model in this watercolor wasn't seated despite its given title. And the model in the watercolor on the right wasn't standing. This beautiful gouache is invariably shown as a horizontal, even though the signature specifies a vertical re reading. This may seem like a minor detail, but I think Sheila's counterintuitive signature orientations speak volumes about how radically transgressive his approach was and remains to this day. The other transgressive aspect of Sheila's approach, of course, was his use of underage models. Vienna was teeming with little urchins who could be persuaded to pose for a few coins or bits of candy. Not only were such models cheap, but Sheila had a profound emotional rapport with them, owing to his own relative use and lingering memories of childhood. Almost all Sheila's child models kept their clothes on, but there are some nudes in which the model to our eyes looks disturbingly young. Sheila's relationships with these adolescent models need to be understood within the context of his time. In early 20th century Vienna, it was customary for young men to pair off with significantly younger women. 
Men routinely postponed marriage until their late 20s, but girls were often spoken for in their teens. Sheila's father, Adolf, for example, had selected his bride when she was only 12 years old. They married when the artist's mother turned 17 and Adolf was 28. Late marriage created a period of protracted adolescence for young men who were expected to sow their wild oats with sex workers. And in Vienna, the majority of sex workers were minors. Sex with adolescent prostitutes was not only tacitly condoned, it was openly encouraged. The law made a distinction between girls who were judged, quote unquote, inherently wanton, and proper middle class young ladies who, of course, were off limits. Sheila's first recognizable girlfriend slash model, known only as the black-haired girl owing to her hair color, was probably a 15 or 16-year-old sex worker. So long as Sheila remained in Vienna, no one, no parent or other well-meaning adult, ever questioned the artist's use of underage models. However, in 1911, Sheila left Vienna for Krumau, a medieval town south of Prague that was his mother's birthplace and his favorite landscape subject. In that provincial environment, his unconventional lifestyle quickly drew negative attention, for he'd brought with him a new girlfriend, Vali Neutzel, who would remain his companion and principal model for the next four years. Egon's and Vali's open cohabitation, combined with the fact that they didn't attend church, was widely condemned by the Kromau locals. Several months after arriving, Sheila was evicted by his landlord for drawing a nude model in the garden. However, instead of returning to Vienna, where his artistic lifestyle was more acceptable, Sheila headed off to Neulenkbach, another provincial backwater. And here, matters went from bad to worse. As he'd done in Vienna, Sheila continued to use local children as models. All the surviving works from this period suggest that the resulting drawings were entirely chaste. However, these kids were not, like the urchins of Vienna, inherently wanton. They were sheltered, middle-class kids with protective, anxious parents. And so it happened that a teenage girl who developed a crush on Sheila decided to run away from home and sought refuge with the artist. Egon and Vali agreed to bring her to her grandmother in Vienna, but the girl eventually got cold feet and asked to be taken home. In all, she was gone less than three days, and with Vali present the whole time, it isn't likely that she was molested. Nevertheless, the girl's father went to the police, who launched an all-out investigation. On April 13, 1912, Sheila was arrested. He remained in jail for a total of 24 days and was eventually convicted of, quote, unquote, offenses against public morality. It was believed that the children who hung out in his studio had been exposed to pornographic art. It may strike us as naive, and in fact it is naive, but Sheila really had no idea what he'd done wrong. He saw himself literally as Saint Sebastian, a martyr to his beliefs. And what Sheila believed, in no uncertain terms, was that he had a spiritual mission that made him akin to a religious figure or monk. Not only did he adopt a monk-like caftan, similar to the one worn by Klimt when he painted, but he regularly depicted himself as part of a priestly brotherhood of artists. He also routinely described his art in mystical terms. Playing upon the semantic duality of artistic and spiritual vision, Sheila referred to himself as a seer. And Vali wasn't just the artist's model, model and lover, but his equal, a fellow seer. Nevertheless, 
If Sheila's goal, like Klimt's, was to enlighten a Philistine public, he was now compelled to recognize that most people were, metaphorically speaking, blind. The so-called prison incident was proof of that. In Sheila's view, it was society and not he that was at fault. Hindering the artist is a crime, he howled. The real crime, if there was one, lay in Sheila's inability to comprehend the contemporary double standard, which held that it was okay to have sex out of wedlock so long as one concealed one's activities behind closed doors. It was okay also to have sex with a minor so long as the child was a professional prostitute. What wasn't okay was to have an open, mutually supportive relationship with a woman who wasn't one's wife or to let proper middle-class children get even a whiff of the supposedly illicit goings-on in an artist's studio. Sheila's crime had been, simply, that he was oblivious to these nuances. But Sheila had learned his lesson. Hereafter, he rarely do children and never again without their parents' consent. He also began a gradual return to the bourgeois lifestyle that was, after all, his birthright. In 1915, he broke off with Vali and instead married a nice middle-class girl, Edith Harms, whom you see in the portrait on the right. The painting on the left, Death and Maiden, commemorates Sheila's breakup with Vali. The works executed during the period of Sheila's transition from Vali to Edith indicate that the process wasn't easy. Pinprick or button eyes reflect a pervasive sense of alienation. The intense, flickering feelings so prominent in the artist's early work are replaced by masks of stunned confusion. In many self-portraits from this time, the seer seems to have been blinded. Sheila's 1914 depictions of female models are similarly depersonalized and blind. Gradually, however, a new approach began to emerge from the chrysalis of confusion. Almost literally in this watercolor, one sees a new paradigm of robust sexuality evolving from the dehumanized representations of 1914. After 1915, Sheila's watercolors and drawings became more responsive to three-dimensional volume. And although he retained a tendency to highlight emotional inflection points with dabs of unnatural bright reds and greens, he now sculpted the flesh with a soft underlayer of brown wash. At the same time, Sheila became more empathic toward his portrait subjects. In 1915, he was drafted into the Austrian army, where he was assigned to guard Russian prisoners of war. Unlike most Europeans, who initially embraced the war with patriotic fervor, Sheila, from the outset, recognized the senselessness of the conflict and advocated prophetically for a single united Europe. The plight of the bedraggled Russian captives, combined with Sheila's experience of marriage, awakened a new humanism in the artist. Sheila spent much of 1916 working at a POW camp in the rural hamlet of Mühling. Because Mühling wasn't in a war zone, Sheila was, Edith was allowed to accompany him but military duties severely curtailed his artistic output. Then, in early 1917, Sheila managed to secure a less demanding post in Vienna. He quickly reestablished his art world connections and for the first time began to experience significant professional success. Following the death of Gustav Klimt in February 1918, Sheila was widely recognized as Austria's leading modern artist. A sold-out exhibition at the Vienna Secession in March confirmed his new stature. 
One reason for Sheila's sudden success was that his work was much less disturbing. In tandem with the dimensional refinement of his coloring style, his lines had by 1917 grown smoother and rounder, capable of suggesting vol volume without any further embellishment. These stylistic changes, coupled with the artist's more humanistic outlook, stimulated a demand for his portraits. As a result, in the last two years of his life, Sheila received a great many commissions for both oils and drawings. Sheila's increased realism is also evident in his late nudes and semi-nudes. Far more beautiful than his earlier work in this vein, the late nudes fit quite comfortably within the classical tradition. For the first time, perhaps, it can be said that Sheila's women are genuinely sexy. When the artist died on October 31st, 1918, he knew that the World War would soon be over, but he never experienced the armistice that we are commemorating today. His premature death leaves hanging the tantalizing question what would have happened next. Sheila's oeuvre, comprising roughly 3,000 works on paper and over 300 paintings, may be interpreted as a visual coming-of-age story. Marked by the indelible stamp of youth, his work follows the path toward maturity and records faithfully the growing wisdom of adulthood. There are collectors and critics who feel that Sheila sold out his original vision by turning in the end toward a relatively placid, pleasing style. But I think these people miss the point. It was inevitable that Sheila, like all adolescents, would grow up. What is exceptional about him is that he remains one of the only artists ever to capture the revelations and agonies of adolescence in all their brilliant fury. Occupying a liminal zone between childhood and adulthood, teenagers aren't yet fully socialized. Sheila, like the figures in his drawings and watercolors, was unmoored and therefore able to imagine a different, freer world. And this, I think, is why his work remains relevant and is discovered afresh by each successive generation. There is no modern art, Sheila said. There is only one art, and it is eternal. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions, uh, and I have a gizmo that will supposedly translate your questions if you ask them in French into English. So let's give that a try. Uh, is there a microphone for people or? Okay, so someone will come to you with a microphone. Just raise your hand. Thank you. Um, what do you think, I mean, um, was Egon Schiller aware of what was going on in the international art scene of his time? And what do you think would have been next for him? Okay, two difficult questions. Sheila was uh, sort of aware of what was going on in art, but he never went to Paris. He talked about going to Paris, but he was somehow very rooted in Austria uh, and the Austrian environment. And most of what he saw also in the way of foreign art were things that had made it to Austria. So he saw things um, maybe half a generation after they had happened. He saw, for example, Van Gogh. He saw Ferdinand Holdler. Uh, he saw the symbolists. He saw uh, Austrians like Anton Romako, who was rediscovered in the late 19th century. So his outlook was, I would say, international, filtered through an Austrian 
lens. Uh, he talked about Cubism, but he had no idea, really, uh, what Cubism was all about, uh, intellectually or formally. It was just a word to him. What would have happened next? It's really, really hard to say. Uh, there are two schools of thought on that. Uh, one is basically that he had burned out, uh, that the circle was completed somehow in his last works, and you know, kind of that he died at the right time. Uh, the other school of thought says, you know, if you look at those last paintings and you see his growing command of painterly expressionism, you might have seen him really grow into a very, very accomplished painter in oil uh, and become as great a painter in the end as he is a draftsman. Another question? Anyone else? Yeah? Thanks very much. Wondering in this politically correct age of gender studies and, you know, children, sex and children and so on, how you as a scholar actually attend to showing and promoting Sheila when I imagine there's some issues you run into. I'd be curious for your, your experience on that. Ah, yes. <laughs> Sorry for asking. No, no, no. Um, I think, well, I think two things. Uh, as I tried to explain in my talk, you really cannot apply the standards of today to someone who lived over a hundred years ago. And everything that Sheila did uh, with women and with uh, also models whom we would certainly consider too young. Uh, they wouldn't, under the circumstances, have been considered too young at the time. Uh, everything that he did there was totally normal. What I find extraordinary and what I really try to stress, and again, I tried to stress this in my talk, was the way he liberated female sexuality through his portrayal of these models. Uh, and that's not to say that he was a feminist. He certainly wasn't a feminist, and he grew up to be uh, prob probably would have been a, a fairly conventional, dictatorial, bourgeois husband to Edith. But as a teenager, uh, the, the playing field was leveled because he was as vulner vulnerable, maybe more vulnerable even, than his models, if you consider that they were probably professional prostitutes and he was having his first experiences. So in the way that he allows their sexual powers to dominate in these works, uh, he does something that no artist had ever done before and that very few male artists have ever done even today. And I think that's the reason that a lot of contemporary women artists, uh, people like Tracy Emin or Jenny Saville, uh, admire him. More questions? You answered earlier. Now, I'd like to know if the question of abstraction, did abstraction reach Vienna? Um, Kukov, for instance, was in Prague, and then he went to Paris. Uh, are these discussions uh, felt in Vienna? Excuse me, I think I need the translation again. That didn't quite come through. Translator? I can propose the question, perhaps. So I'll ask the question again. The discussion on abstract art, did this discussion reach Vienna in those years? Did 
which discussion? The discussion? The passage dans l'abstraction. The around 1911-1912, artists started being abstract. Is this uh, was was this understood in Vienna? Abstraction. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Got it. <laughs> uh, I'm not even sure that abstraction, as we think of it today, uh, was understood in the rest of Europe. Uh, you have in Germany Kandinsky sort of struggling toward the first abstract works uh, in the years just before World War I. Cubism wasn't really a fully abstract style. It was a, a way, a formal way of interpreting reality. So, no, I don't think that any conception of abstraction really reached Vienna until after the First World War. Anyone else? Come on, ask some questions. <laughs> what did Chile mean when he said art can't be modern? He wanted to he wanted to make statements that would be timeless. He wanted to make, to express something about the human condition that was eternal and enduring, and not something that was the product of the style of any given time. And in fact, uh, I think personally, some of you may disagree, that he did achieve that. You know, the, the last time uh, I was in Paris, I went to see the show of the blue and rose period Picassos at the Dorsay. And that show ends when Picasso was 28. So exactly when Sheila died. And I think that if Picasso had died at 28, I think those, we would still consider those great works. But I think we would look at them as something very much rooted in that one time and place. And I don't think that when you look at Sheila's works, you have any idea when they were created. Uh, I, I think they really do transcend his time. Uh, there has been quite a lot of Egon Schiele exhibitions from last year and this year. And could you evaluate uh, those blockbusters and m most important ones and this, um, tell us which one, the, their strengths? And also, is there, was there, is there anything new for us to discover through those exhibitions? Wow. <laughs> well, of course, I'm going to say this one is the best. <laughs> Uh, this one actually, in many ways, uh, is the most comprehensive, I have to say. And when you look at an exhibition from the inside, uh, you're always aware of the loans that didn't come through. You know, it could have been even better. Uh, but the other exhibitions, uh, are very focused in a different way. Uh, for example, uh, there, the Albertina, which has a fantastic collection of Sheila works on paper, uh, divided that collection into three. And they said, instead of doing one big Sheila show, they would do three 
Klimt Sheila shows, one in Moscow, one in Boston, and one in London. Uh, and the works are beautiful. I was just in London, but it's a small show. And it's very hard with just one third of the Albertina's collection in mixing the works with Klimt to really get a sense of what Sheila was all about. Uh, the show at the Belvedere is, I think, on a scholarly level, probably the most profound show for me as, as an expert. Uh, that's the show from which I learned the most uh, because uh, the curators really went in depth uh, behind the collection of the Belvedere, looking at provenance, looking at condition, looking at materials, looking at restoration history. Uh, so for the specialist, it's a great show, but it might be a little bit too specialized for, for uh, the average viewer, and it does focus mainly on the Belvedere's collection. Uh, then there are are the shows at the Leopold Museum. And the Leopold Museum really belongs in a category by itself because the Leopold Museum uh, has one of the world's largest Sheila collections. And they're always on view. So their jubileum shows didn't really you know, show the visitor anything that you wouldn't ordinarily see if you go to the Leopold Museum. Um, and then there's the Schofield Thayer collection at the Metropolitan Museum, uh, which is the Schofield Thayer collection. So that includes not just Sheila, but uh, Klimt and Picasso. And is also one collector's slightly skewed perspective and not, not certainly uh, a comprehensive presentation of any of the artists. So I don't know, have I missed any shows? <laughs> Oh, and then, of course, yes, we have our own show <laughs> at the Gallery St. Etienne in New York, uh, which just opened. Uh, we opened it on Halloween on the actual 100th anniversary of Sheila's death, and it will run through March 2nd. Uh, and that's a pretty good show, if I do say so myself. I should also mention that we just launched the Sheila Catalog Resiné online. This is phase one, uh, which includes all the oil paintings, graphics, sketchbooks, and sculpture. And you can access that at agonsheilaonline.org. And in the next year, we're going to add the, the watercolors and drawings. Could you please tell us a bit about the early collectors of Sheila works? Ah, yes. <laughs> Maybe you could. Uh, this is a friend of mine, and we both work on provenance. Uh, the early collectors of Sheila works, not from the perspective of Holocaust era provenance, which is a whole subject unto itself. Um, I would say that there are two groups we can talk about. Uh, the group of collectors who really supported Sheila at the very, very beginning of his career uh, were men, uh, and they were, uh, they had a very close personal relationship with the artist, which was something Sheila expected. He really turned to these elder men, kind of as substitute fathers. And they were Oskar Reichel, Heinrich Benesch, Karl Reininghaus, and Arthur Rössler. Uh, and they, they were constantly, they, they were very close to the artist, but they were also constantly having disagreements about money because Sheila just expected to be paid regardless of whether he had actually, you know, given them 
value for their money, given them art. Um, he didn't think that he should have to sell his art, he said, like salt at a grocer's. Uh, and the collectors, you know, kind of did want some art for their money. That was why they were doing it. So Sheila, toward the end of his life, began to pull away. He, he became somewhat estranged from that first group of collectors and began to acquire a larger group of patrons. Uh, these were the patrons who, in the last years of his life, commissioned portraits, people like uh, Ritter von Bauer, the art dealer Guido Arnaud, uh, the, his army comrade Karl Grunwald, uh, the Steiner family, uh, the Kohler family. And these were all people who um, might have become uh, you know, supporters of the artist if he had lived, but whose collecting activities tend to, you know, to kind of fall off after Sheila's death. Uh, after, in the 1920s, uh, you have people like Erich Lederer, whose portrait Sheila had painted in 1912-13, who's now an adult and is much more enthusiastic about the artist's work than his parents had been. His parents were supporters mainly of Klimt. Uh, you have more dealers becoming involved, people like my grandfather, Otto Kallir, at the Neue Gallery, people like Gustav Nebehai, people like Richard Lani, uh, people like uh, Leah Bondi Yarai uh, at the Gallery Vertla. And you also have collectors who collect in great depth uh, Heinrich Rieger, uh, Fritz Grunbaum, uh, Fritz Lang, the Frit film director, uh, trying to think of other people who had, a, there, were, there were a number of people who had substantial bodies of work that they accumulated uh, between Sheila's death in 1918 and the Anschluss in 1938. And then, of course, because I would say at that point, at least half of the major Sheila collectors were Jewish. And so these collections got dispersed in all sorts of different and usually kind of horrific ways. More questions? Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I have two questions, if you don't mind. My first question is, uh, according to you, which artist has been most influenced by Egon Schiller? And my second question is, what is your reading of the present exhibition between uh, Egon Schiller and Basquiat, the connection between uh, both of us? Thank um, you, both of them, sorry. Thank you. Sure. Uh, you know, it's hard for me to, to pick out any one artist as being most influenced. Uh, the name, weirdly or not, that comes first to mind is David Bowie. Uh, I, I think that there is a tradition of gestural body language that you see almost more directly in performance and music than you than you do um, necessarily in the work of other painters, even though, as I mentioned before, there are painters who very much admire and have been influenced by Sheila. Uh, fashion photography also, I think, uh, has been very influenced by Sheila. Uh, indirectly, in, in, in terms of the way uh, he uh, presents female sexuality in a, in a much more direct way, uh, and also overtly, uh, Richard Avedon is one of the people who, who acknowledged uh, a direct debt to, to Sheila. Sheila and Basquiat, this is a tough one. Uh, because 
personally, I wouldn't have made that pairing. Uh, but you can. Um, and if you do, uh, I think the pairing becomes as interesting or maybe even more interesting for the differences than for the similarities. Uh, for example, um, I talked about uh, the artist Sheila's use of negative space and the way uh, the figure is positioned in, in this void that's both uh, metaphorical and literal, the, the blankness of the canvas or the sheet. Basquiat also tends to sort of sometimes to sort of plop his subject in a, in a kind of empty space, but you don't have that kind of very conscious structuring between the edges of the figure and the edges of the picture plane that you do with Sheila. Uh, similarly, you could say that both artists have an expressionistic style of brushwork, but with Sheila, it's highly, highly controlled, and with Basquiat, it's just the opposite. Pourriez-vous, s'il vous plaît, euh, éclairer davantage le... Could you shed light on the role the role of art and of the artist for Agon Schiller. And I have another question. Don't you think that sometimes there is an ironic dimension in Schiller? Do I have the translator up there, or did I miss it again? Can you, can you hear the translator? The translator is speaking. Can you hear her? Yeah. Okay, so um, could you ask the gentleman to ask his question again, please? Oh, he has to ask his question again? Well, just to make sure. I, okay. had, I did translate it, but he needs to repeat it to make sure that... Uh... So could you further develop on the uh, way Agon Schiller sees the role of art and the role of uh, the artist? At the time. And then another question I have is, don't you think that uh, there is a, some sort of irony in uh, some of uh, Shaler's uh, paintings? Um, the first question was about the role of the artist. Yes? Am I correct? Yeah. Um, OK, the role of the artist. Uh, this vision of the artist as a kind of seer or saint was not unique to Sheila. This was something that went back to the early uh, 19th century and had been developed by the artists of the secession and had also been developed by um, different mystics who, you know, pe people who were actually uh, both spiritualists and in some cases painters. So uh, I wouldn't say that uh, all artists saw themselves that way, but I would also say that Sheila wasn't alone in that view of himself. And in terms of irony, yeah, I think there's irony in his work. Uh, and I think that people somehow fail to see that because the work very often looks so anguished. But Sheila, in part, is playing with us. He's playing with his emotions, and he's playing with our emotions. And he knows that he is coming very close sometimes to going too far, uh, but he toys with, with that boundary line uh, between uh, propriety and excess. Uh, hi, um, I'm up on the top. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm curious about 
there was a there was a show recently at the Neue Gallery in New York, um, and they had mounted the paintings so high, and the the works on paper that you couldn't even see them. And I'm wondering why establishments do this. Uh, well, I, I, establishments don't do that. The Neue Gallery does that. They do that all the time. And well, I. I do kind of know why, because apparently uh, Ronald Lauder just can't get enough, and he all, all of his all of the shows at the Neue Gallery they have too many things, yes. and and they're all they're always hung too densely, and they just from their very first show they adopted that hanging style and they've stuck with it, and I agree with you. I, <laughs> It just boggles my mind because, I mean, Sheila's work especially, his draftsmanship is so important to see up close. Yes. How are you, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's almost like a, um, uh, an egomaniacal <laughs> <laughs> pursuit to have, his, have to have it at my gallery. At my, you know, I, don't, I just don't understand. Cause no. I, it, it, is, it seems as if he must be a passionate collector and, he, I mean, establishing that entire museum, but... You know, I, I guess we're on the same page, but... <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if we should be uh, yeah. psychoanalyzing yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyone <laughs> other than Sheila here. But. Correct. All right, thank you. Sure. Yeah, okay, last question. You mentioned the tra training of Egan Schiele. Can you could you hear me? So you mentioned the training of Egan Schiele in this very classic school, and at one point apparently he had to leave because he was completely opposed to a traditional uh, and very academic training. Now I wanted to know how his work was influenced or not by this very academic uh, training and what became of that school. Okay, I, the, the problem with this translation thing is that your voice is much stronger than that voice. Uh, and that's what makes it so hard to understand the translation. Uh, but I, th it, if I, tell me if I said this correctly. Um, you want to know to what extent uh, Sheila was influenced by his academic training? Was that the question? We? Oui? Okay. <laughs> I think that Sheila was very influenced by his academic training. Uh, I think, first of all, if you look at his very earliest works, uh, he was a realist. He did want to depict visible reality, and he never gave that up. He, he never would have become an abstract artist. Uh, he was very, very fast, and his facility, his ability to capture a recognizable likeness of, of someone in just a few short lines uh, is, in a way, exactly what they tried to teach you to do at the academy. His uh, teacher would often give the class timed exercises, and Sheila was the fastest of all. He, he, he could do all of those things that were demanded of the academy students. He just wanted to take it in a different direction and make it his own. And he didn't want to be told what to draw or how to draw it. But to capture visible reality, that was, that was what he wanted to do. Okay, well thank you all again very much. <laughs>